Well, I will uh, begin with a word of prayer. So, Dearly Father, we just uh, thank you for this day. Again, Lord, I thank you for the students in this class, wherever they are. Uh, help us to uh, glorify you what we do this day, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Okay, so um, I think I stated this uh, maybe Monday, um, but I don't think I proved it yet. I think it's worth going through the proof. And so here it is. f of x has a multiple root alpha, if and only if alpha is the root of the derivative. And um, this is one of those things that um, really maybe even has, I mean, it's kind of a nice thing to think about even just for the sake of, of you know, calculus or perhaps complex analysis, you know. Um, but anyway, so if f of x has a multiple root alpha, um, then that means that uh, um, there's um, some splitting field, right? Uh, so here I'm, I'm assuming f of x is, you know, polynomial over some field, and alpha is an element of some field, which is not necessarily f, but it's, you know, it's an extension of f. Uh, we know that such an extension exists. Anyway, um, and what's the thing is we have f of x is equal to x minus alpha <coughs> to the n, right, times g of x for what? For some n greater than or equal to 2, and of course g of x is a polynomial over k generally, right? Um, so that's what it means, of course, you have a multiple root. Um, and then to see that that's also a root, so I'm, I'm, of course I'm working on the forward implication at the moment. Um, so just differentiate, right? And um, the formal derivative, of course, uh, has the same properties as the, um, you know, uh, derivative we learned in calculus based on limits and all that. Um, anyway, so we have n times x to the alpha, x minus alpha to the n minus 1, g of x, all right, um, plus uh, x minus alpha to the n, uh, the derivative of, of g. And um, because n is greater than or equal to 2, we can factor out x minus alpha, right, um, like so. And you notice that this is, uh, this makes sense because it, it, at worst it's the constant one, but it could just be x minus alpha or x minus alpha squared and so forth. Um, and then of course, which of course shows that um, x minus alpha is a factor of the derivative and, you know, Clear, clearly. And of course, you could have done this without doing the factoring, right? Um, clear, clear, clearly, if we take the derivative and we evaluate it alpha, we get zero. So it's a root. All right. Now, the other direction, right? The other direction. Um, suppose that uh, alpha is a root of both f and the derivative. Alpha root of both f of x and the derivative, all right? So what's that mean? That means that, um, well, because it's root of f of x, of course, we have f of x is equal to uh, x minus alpha times h of x, right, um, for some polynomial h. and. Let's see here, and that implies what? That implies that the derivative with respect to x of f is equal to what? It's equal to h of x um, plus x minus alpha. Uh, the derivative with respect to x uh, of h. Um, but then you notice that we could I mean, we can solve this for h, right? What's that say? That says this h of x is equal to what? h of x is equal to dxf uh, minus 
parentheses x minus alpha dxh. But we know that, um, I mean, first of all, we know that the derivative of h exists. At worst, it's 0. <laughs> I mean, so whatever. Um, but I don't, I don't think it's that either. It, sorry, words. This right here, though, we're given is x minus alpha, right? I mean, we know that alpha is a root of the derivative. So this is also x minus alpha times some other, uh, let's say, a of x, right? Which, of course, shows you that, um, you know, h of alpha is equal to 0, right? So, thus, um, h of x is equal to x minus alpha times some b of x as well, right? I mean, x minus alpha is a factor of h of x, and then, which, which establishes what I want, right? Because... Thus, uh, f of x is equal to x minus alpha, h of x, but that's x minus alpha times x minus alpha, which is x minus alpha squared times b of x, putting these things together, right? Which shows what? That, that shows that f of x has, has multiple root alpha. Okay. Okay. Now, some immediate applications of that um, from page 547, of course, of Summit and Foot. I don't think I did these applications yet. I think I've. So let's get to them. Let's see here. So example one, um, if we look at x to the p to the n minus x, all right, call that thing f of x, all right, um, what's the derivative? Well, the derivative would be p to the n, x to the p to the n to the n minus 1, all right, minus 1, right? And let's see here. If we're in, and this is, you know, an element of uh, f of x with the characteristic of f being the prime p. Okay, that's the context here. So given that, the first term here drops out, right? And you know, that, that's kind of shocking, isn't it, right? I mean, if you think about it in terms of regular calculus, you know, that, that's really kind of foreign to our experience. If we start with a p to, p to the nth order, p to the nth order uh, polynomial, and we drop to a, to a constant, just like that. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly disappointed that you came, because I felt like this might have been the day that I actually gave a lecture to no students in an actual classroom in an actual class time, which has never happened yet. Uh, you ruined it. Um, ah. <laughs> um, so what I've done so far is just gone through the proof that the uh, multiple, you know, the, the, when the polynomial and the derivative share a root that's equivalent to multiple root. I stated it the other day, I didn't prove it, I proved that today. Um, yeah. And now I'm just going through the examples right quick here. Um, so of course that's minus one, which is not equal to zero. And that shows that this polynomial f of x is separable um, over any uh, field of characteristic p because uh, well, the derivative has no roots, right? I mean, there's no, no zero for that. Poly I mean, the polynomial minus one, put whatever you want in for the variable, um, yeah, you can't have a zero. Uh, then example two here, f of x equals to x to the n minus 
minus 1. Here we have derivative x and x to the n minus 1, of course. Um, and let's see here. If the characteristic of f does not divide n, right, if the characteristic, so suppose this is in, you know, polynomials over f. So if the characteristic of, of f um, does not divide um, n, then, you know, alpha equals to zero uh, is multiple root, right? Because if you plug in zero, we get zero here. And, oh, wait a minute. No. I'm sorry. What am I saying? If we plug in zero up here, I mean, it's a multiple root of the derivative. It's not a multiple root of the, the f of x either, is it? So I shouldn't say that. No, no, I, I'm sorry. I can't even apply my own proposition today. Right? <laughs> I mean, plug in 0 to f, we don't get 0. It, we, need a, we need the root to be a 0 of both the, the polynomial and its derivative for it to be a multiple 0. Yeah. All right. Let me stop trying to think. If the characteristic of f does not divide n, then, oh, well, okay, then the derivative, well, I'm just, <laughs> I feel like an idiot for erasing what I just wrote, uh, it has alpha equal to zero, <laughs> it has n minus one fold root, yeah, whereas f prime of zero, whereas f prime of zero equals minus one. Obviously, I was not well when I wrote these notes. I think, what does that mean? Um, all right, so I mean, what we're trying to, our, our ultimate goal here is to decide whether or not this this polynomial is separable over f, right? So for it to be separable, it can't have multiple roots. Um, so the derivative being n x to the n minus 1 means that either the derivative has no roots, because it's just the constant, right? I mean, if, if the characteristic divides n, then the derivative is just, just it's a constant polynomial 0. Um, if it, right, and if, if the characteristic does divide, does not divide, and then it's got a repeated uh, uh, n minus one fold repeated root, right? The derivative, the derivative does. So your choices for the zeros of the derivative are either no zeros at all, or the or just zero, n fold times, n minus one fold times. And the re you start to understand why we have to say that, too, because if we didn't say that, we wouldn't have the factor theorem, right? Like, um, but, so then the point is, logically, the derivative either has um, no zeros or just zero as n minus one fold zero. Then go back and look at f. If you plug in zero, we get minus one. So this is separable. Because by Proposition 33, it doesn't have a the derivative and the polynomial do not share a zero. Um, and uh, example three says, if f has characteristic p which divides n, then there are fewer than n, fewer than n distinct roots of unity over f. Hmm. Okay. All right, and move along here. Corollary thirty four. 
states that uh, every every irreducible polynomial over field of characteristic um, zero is separable. And a polynomial over such a field um, is separable if and only if it is the product of distinct distinct irreducible polynomials. All right, so here's the proof of that. Suppose f has a, has a field of characteristic zero, and suppose, suppose so if characteristic of f equal to zero, p of x in f of x um, irreducible, all right, of degree n, right? Well then the derivative of p uh, has degree n minus one, right? Yep. See, be, yeah, because if, um, if the if the um, if you didn't have that, that would that would imply the characteristic was not characteristic zero. I mean, you could if you if you had that that wasn't the case. I think you could actually use that to prove the characteristic. If you think about it, polynomial is a function. Feed feed one into it. It would give you that n minus one was equal to zero, even though n minus one was not zero. Yeah. In okay anyway. Up to constant factors, right? Up to constant factors. Up to constant factors, the only factors in P of X are what? Ah, yes, what does irreducible mean? It means we don't have reduction, right? So if we think about factoring P of X, what are the What are the factors in what? They're just one, right? And P of X itself. So what's that mean? That means that uh, the derivative of p of x must be relatively prime to p of x, which shows that this shows any irreducible polynomial over a field characteristic zero is, is separable. Um, let's see here. I mean, if you don't find that sentence convincing, you could do a proof by contradiction, right? Like, if you suppose that there was a common zero for p of x and uh, if p of x and uh, the derivative of p of x had a common zero over some splitting field, that would imply they had a common factor of x minus alpha. Um, did that do it? Let's see here. Do you, do you understand why this gives it to us? I don't remember, I don't really understand it. I don't remember the exact statement. Three, three, is it talking about, is it 
Oh, th yeah. Thirty-three says if they if they don't share any um, if they don't share a multiple root in some splitting field in some in some extension field of f. Well, the thing is, if we, but if we look at an extension field of f, it doesn't change the degree of the polynomials, right? Like, um, um, let's see here. Hmm. Curses. Oh, but part of Proposition 33 also was that uh, it has no multiple roots. Um, it's, in other words, it's separable if and only if the uh, polynomial is relatively primed to its derivative. And that relative primeness is in the original field, not in the extension. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I just didn't remember the exact one. Does, that, does, it, does it make sense to you that the P of X and the derivative must be relatively prime? Okay. All right, so move along here before I. Um, all right, he says the point of the proof in the cor the, the the point of this the point of the proof in the corollary that can fail in characteristic p is the statement that the derivative dx p of x is um, the derivative of p of x is is a degree n minus one, and the characteristic p the derivative of any power of x to the pm any power x to the pm of x to the p is identically zero. Let's see, I'll just write that down. dx x to the pm, pm x to the pm minus one is equal to zero over characteristic of f is equal to p. So if the derivative possible for the degree of the derivative to decrease by more than one, right? Um, if the derivative um, of the irreducible polynomial p of x is non-zero, however, then just as before we may conclude that uh, p of x must be separable. Hmm. All right, well, let me, let me move along here. <clears throat> oh, the, the second sentence in corollary 34 should be clear enough because um, if you had common, if you if you didn't have distinct irreducibles, then that would imply the repeated imply a repeated root because you know two different, I mean two two common irreducible factors would also pick up the same zeros in, in the appropriate extension. Yeah. All right, moving <laughs> along here. Slowly but surely. Proposition 35. Um, and I think this was a homework for, problem for you guys last time. Um, if if uh, the characteristic of f is equal to p, right, then for a and b and f, um, we have that a plus b to the power p is equal to a to the p plus b to the p also sometimes known as the freshman's dream. And um, I'll see here, a plus, although usually for p close to a half, uh, which is not even on the table for us here. Um, a, b, a, b to the p is uh, a to the p, b to the p. Uh, well, that's not, the second part there is kind of like, yeah. Um, oh, well, the reason, I mean, this is not, this, of course, is not true, for example, if we take the real field. But this would be true for the real field or other, you know, less exotic characteristic zero fields. Um, <laughs> but taken collectively, what these show you is thus the map, right? Phi 
um, or maybe he has a special name. Oh yeah, he uses phi. So phi of a equal a to the p. In other words, phi is a mapping from where to where. Um, f to f, right? It defines a what? Yeah. And, well, I guess an automorphism, right? Oh, you're right. He says, actually, an injective field homomorphism. Exactly. That's what he says. Ah, good point. Yes, if it's finite, then it would be an automorphism, right? Now, the proof of this is really a straightforward calculation. Um, basically, the point is that um, to look at a plus b to the p, you, you, know, you expand uh, by the binomial theorem, which holds in this context. And when you look at the coefficients of the binomial theorem, all of them have a multiple of p, except for the, uh, the, book, the bookends of it, so to speak, the last and the first. All the ones in the middle have a p. So they, they drop out. I, this was a homework problem for you guys last semester, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was fun. Now, definition. This is the Frobenius endomorphism of F. Well, um, let's see here. He's a <laughs> so Sam has asked me what's the proof it's injective. Thumb and foot is rather insulting to you at this point. He says, they say at the end of page 548, the second equation is trivial, as is the fact that phi is injective. Not my words. No, let's, let's work it out, though. So uh, what do we need to get injectivity? Oh, sure, yeah, let's go back to basics. Phi of A equal to phi of B. I guess we could do something like, it's more helpful if I do something kind of like this. That will help me think, because today I'm not thinking very clearly. So this would be x to the p equals a to the p, which would then give us the x to the p. Although I feel like, he, he just said it's trivial, so I, I feel like I'm probably not <laughs> doing this the right way. Um, you know, that's x to what? x to the... Is that... Uh, I don't know. Well... Well, if we do... X, we have x to the p times a to the minus. Ah, that's not helpful. Never mind. This is allegedly trivial, though. I feel... I feel... Uh, I feel embarrassed if this is... I mean... So, <laughs> um, is it, is it, a, is, 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 can we use the group theory here? Can we use the group theory, perhaps? See, because this is a, uh, I mean, what's, what's inject, I mean, just use the group of units, right? Like, um, the group of units is what? Or whatever notation. I've been reading too many books, I forget which is our notation. Everything non-zero is multiplicative inverse, right? So that's a group. And if you look at the kernel of, of this phi, 
I mean, it's a group homomorphism, well, right? We, Okay, so you have convinced yourself by looking at the uh, the ring, the, the kernel of the, the kernel of phi as a ring homomorphism is zero. Okay, good, good. I think there's a similar argument we could give, you know, with respect to the the group structure there. But anyway, um, let me just uh, well, we're a little bit short on time. Let me just read read the results of the rest of this section here. Um, so, next we, um, sorry, some things are better written, corollary 36, suppose um, F is finite field of characteristic P, then every element, every element of F is a piece power in F. Right. So yeah, like you're pointing out, if we have injective in the finite context, that automatically implies surjective, and consequently, this is a surjection, which is to say that every every element um, of the field can be can be written as a p p power of some other element. It's pretty cool. Um, and uh, so the next thing he does is he proves an an analog of corollary thirty four for finite fields. Um, it's a beautiful calculation. Um, and the, the, the result of the calculation is Proposition 37. Every irreducible polynomial over a finite field is separable. Um, a polynomial in um, f of x is separable if and only if it is the product of distinct irreducible polynomials in f of x. In other words, we get the same thing we had for characteristic zero over finite field. Um, and then that brings us to both of these things together um, we call uh, what are, they're, 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 what are known as perfect fields, a field K <coughs> of characteristic P um, is called perfect if every element of k is a piece power in k. We could write that symbolically as k is equal to k to the p. Right. Also, um, characteristic fields, characteristic f equal to zero means f is perfect. So, certainly finite fields are perfect and characteristic zero fields are perfect. Are there other perfect fields out there? I think so, but yeah, but certainly not all. Because as you pointed out, the, like in principle, that Frobenius endomorphism doesn't have to be a surjection. I mean, you could say for a field of characteristic P, it's perfect if the Frobenius endomorphism is a surjection, right? That would be another way to say it. It's not, I'm not saying anything that's, that's more trivial than the thing we were. <laughs> yeah. um, then he has something about the existence and uniqueness of uh, finite fields. Um, let's see here. And he, he talks about Proposition 38, P 
P of X irreducible polynomial over field F, characteristic P, there's unique integer K greater than zero, and a unique irreducible separable polynomial, P sep of X, such that P of X is P sep of X to the P to the K. So, um, there is some further technology known for fields of characteristic P that deal with the inseparable case that there's this inseparable degree versus separable. And if we need it later, we'll get back into it. I'm just not, I'm not going to get into it here. You can read it. And um, finally, though, the um, ultimate thing in this section, uh, a field K is said to be separable or algebraically separable of F if every element in K is a root of a separable polynomial over F, equivalently the minimal polynomial over F of every element of K is separable. A field which is not separable is inseparable. So a field K is, right. And then corollary 39, every finite extension of a perfect field is separable. In particular, every finite extension of Q or a finite field is separable. And so this is good news. Irreducibility and, you know, um, separable, you know, these are indistinguishable concepts in some sense for a perfect field. So, yeah. All right, well, that was the punchline. I'm sorry it took me forever to get through this section, and I don't feel like I did it justice either. Um, up next, of course, is the, uh, the cyclotomic polynomials, which I guess I probably shouldn't try to do today. Um, but it's just these four pages. <laughs> uh, I guess I could summarize the... No, I should. I probably should just do that Friday. That would be the decent thing to do, right? All right. Well, if I'm feeling energetic today, maybe I'll make a little, little video on them. What do you think? I probably shouldn't do that. Well, thanks for humoring me this morning. <laughs> <laughs>